This cameraman is panning. Panning is moving the camera this way and that. Too often, the cameraman pans as the spirit moves him. Lots of fun when taking the picture, but pity the future audience. The result of excessive panning is usually a confusing conglomeration like this. Panning is ordinarily prompted by the beginner's desire to show everything too quickly. Instead of seeing everything, however, the audience doesn't get a good look at anything. Nothing is on the screen long enough or clearly enough. If the cameraman would take the same subject in a series of individual shorter scenes from various distances and from different angles, the result would be a group of related, sharp, undistorted scenes like these, which, when combined, give the audience a much more distinct conception of both the subject as a whole and of parts of the subject. Make up your mind that you are not going to pan unless you positively have to. You may wonder when panning is permitted. Panning is permitted only when the subject you are photographing keeps moving around unpredictably, as in the case of wildlife, sporting events. Whenever you cannot direct the action or where taking time out to move your camera would result in missing a vital part of a performance. To make panning look really professional, keep the subject you are following in the center of the camera's frame as nearly as possible. Keep moving with the subject. If the subject stops, you stop. If the subject moves in another direction, pan with the subject in that direction. However, when the scene is the last in a series of pan shots, permitting the subject to move out of the frame is often very effective. If you have trouble following a fast moving subject, try leading the subject, that is, Keep an extra lot of margin in the finder, on the side toward which the subject is moving. Don't ever let the main part of the subject get out of the finder, except when ending a scene. Again we say, don't pan unless you positively have to. Even a shot of a moving object, taken from one good angle, may result in a better and more spectacular scene. Next to panning, failure to use a tripod is the movie novice's greatest mistake. By using the tripod, you may select your scene, frame, and study its composition with all the finesse of an artist. No jiggly pictures, no variation of what you meant to get and what you finally got, as is likely when hand-holding. But sometimes you'll be taking pictures you'll have no authority to direct, or shooting an action which only happens once like this good old-fashioned scrap which flared up because one boy fell on another too hard. A really live-wire cameraman gets right in there to record such priceless schoolboy antics as these even though the action isn't in the script. It's in just such a moment that the amateur is tempted to throw aside his tripod because he can't get it set up in time. Consequently, he loses his picture. If he knew how to handle his tripod, its use would be no problem. Here's a tip worth remembering. Keep the two rear legs the same length as each other. Make the forward or pointing leg an inch or two longer than the rear legs. When you finish a scene, turn the camera so that it faces the way of the pointing leg. And when you have to run somewhere, close the legs so they won't get tangled in your own. Rest the upper part of the tripod on your shoulder, and you're off. And when you set the tripod down, do so with a pointing leg first, then spread the rear legs back and apart. When making the leveling adjustment, you need move only one leg. If you're really in a hurry, just side over the head of your tripod or top of your camera at an imaginary horizontal line. If your camera is straight, your picture will have to be. If you intend to pan, turn your camera to follow the subject. Make sure the tripod head is level. Otherwise, your camera will tilt sideways 
when you're part way around, even though the camera itself was leveled before you started to pan. To obtain a smooth pan, you must keep your feet in place. Just move your body above the knees as you turn. Walking around your tripod will cause a jerky pan and, of course, jerky pictures on the screen. Every motion picture, regardless of length, is made up of three kinds of scenes. The long shot, of which this scene is an example, the medium shot, and the close-up. They are the ABCs of movie technique. If the Statue of Liberty weren't so famous, you wouldn't know that it is surrounded by water unless you saw it at a distance. Hence the importance of the long shot. It not only shows the subject, but it shows where the subject is located and what is around it. It establishes the subject to the audience. This is a medium shot of Miss Liberty, showing the whole subject as close as possible without cutting off any vital part of it. And here is the close-up. It has about the same proportions of framing as you would use if taking a close-up of a friend, the head and top of shoulders. To show you the value of using a variety of shots and making a picture, we have selected some scenes from a Victory Garden film sent us by one of our earlier students. Did you notice how nicely he established us with his opening shot? Using the Victory Garden sign was a commendable idea. It helps to tell us where we are and what the picture is going to tell us a story about. Now watch. Notice how the cameraman keeps working in closer to his action, even to the point of extreme close-ups. In case you're wondering, there is no set order for using your shots, although it is usually best to follow the long shot medium shot close-up procedure to start your picture. Remember, your audience sees only what you shoot. It cannot go in to get a better look at the subject or move back to see what is around the subject unless you move your camera back and forth. For instance, here the cameraman wanted to show the moving of his characters from one location to another. So he moved back to show them our route thus giving his audience a chance to see where the characters were going in relation to where they had been. Too many close-ups in succession cause the loss of clear-cut conception of the overall picture. It is a proven fact that the audience seldom remembers accurately what has been shown more than one or two scenes back. That is why it is so necessary to show a general view every now and then. Such views are appropriately called re-establishing shots. Just as there is no set order for shots, there is no set length for them either. Once you have learned the ABCs of it, the key to successful movie making is plenty of sensible variety in your technique. No, screen direction in this case doesn't have to do with directing a motion picture. We'll show you what we mean by joining this couple on their hike, if they don't object. Well, let's make up our minds. Which way is it going to be? It's certain that if they don't know which way they're going, we won't. That's an idea. Let's toss for it. Settle. So we're going this way. Which way is this way? In motion picture lingo, these hikers are going from left to right. They are, aren't they? In each consecutive scene, they are progressing from the left side of the screen to the right. That's screen direction. Now they are moving from right to left. Thus our subjects have made what we call a change of screen direction. It is now a right to left screen direction because the hikers are coming from the right side of the picture and moving to the left. But we didn't start that way. Remember the toss? It was determined that their course would be this way, from left to right. Besides, if the action were right to left now, you'd feel as though the hikers were going back to the crossroads again. It is necessary to maintain screen direction if you want your subject to seem to be getting somewhere. If you don't observe screen direction, it will look as though the subject is merely traveling back and forth across the screen, getting nowhere. If your picture is long, sameness in direction may become monotonous. So you'll have to have a change of direction. But don't do what we're doing here. Whenever you put a series of scenes with different screen directions together, 
the result is both frustrating and confusing. Whenever you start using scenes in which the action changes direction, you must first show the change. Like this. Notice how smoothly the action runs, now that we have shown our subjects turn and go the other way. You may change screen direction as often as circumstances and the flow of your story indicate, as long as you show the actual changing. Everyone is familiar with the fact that a motion picture is made up of a series of scenes which, when put together, tell a story or relate a complete episode of action. As shown in lesson three, there have to be long, medium, and close-up shots so that the audience will get a comprehensive look at things. This means the camera is placed in a different location each time a scene changes. Yet in spite of all these scene changes, the subject action must flow continuously as though the scenes were all taken from one spot and the camera had never stopped. You saw the subject arrive with a radio, tune in, and go into her exercise. Every move that she's made since you first saw her has been shown to you as an unbroken flow of action. But do you realize how many times the action was broken while the camera was being moved to each new location for each scene that you are seeing? Unless due care had been taken to keep every detail of the subject's position the same at the start of each new scene as in the end of the preceding scene, this smooth, continuous flow of movement could never exist. So matching action, you see, insofar as the cameraman or his assistant is concerned, is a case of remembering details as they were in the completion of every scene. If we hadn't carefully noted this young lady's posture each time we stopped the camera, her arms, legs, and the pitch of her body certainly wouldn't have been matching so nicely at the change of each scene. In order to let you see for yourself how important matching action is, we're now deliberately ignoring it. Notice the disagreeable jar or jump at the beginning of these scenes. This is because you are now in the place of the audience, seeing scenes follow each other with lightning quickness. A cameraman has a chance to forget the details of the previous scene, but the audience doesn't have. It doesn't take time out while equipment is being moved around for the next shot. In fact, the old scene is still in mind when a new one appears. That's why even the slightest variation from matched action is On an amateur scale, action is often matched by having the subject hold or remember the pose until the camera starts grinding again. This is known as cutting in the camera. The professional method of matching action, however, is that of reshooting the last bit of the previous scene's action at the beginning of the new. The actual matching point is later decided upon in the cutting room. By this system, action can be matched at any point where it had been reshot. Once you cut in the camera, you have no future choice. While lesson five demonstrated that not one second of action is permitted to be skipped at the joining points of consecutive scenes in planned films, the practice of skipping even whole sequences of action is permitted of necessity in the newsreel type. Suppose you are photographing a ball game. It's not likely that you would want to record it play by play. That would take several thousand feet of film. But you would want your audience to feel that it had seen it all. So you'd probably start with some prior to the game scenes in the manner we're showing you. From here on, you shoot only the most spectacular plays as they occur throughout the game. But keep in mind that even though action may be skipped and scenes do not have to be matched as in the controlled action type of picture, they must be tied together sufficiently to give that feeling of a continuous flow of action. Tying together is accomplished by taking numerous cutaway scenes, shots of things and activities which are related to the subject action. In the case of photographing a ball game, the crowds in general and the antics of rabbit fans are always good cutaway material. When you edit your picture, cutaway scenes may be inserted wherever there is a jump in the action, thereby smoothing out the continuity. You've certainly observed how often theatrical newsreels revert to the crowd between plays of a game. Newsreels have to constantly resort to cutaway scenes because they have so many scattered odd and end shots to tie together. 
Yours is the same problem, so you will want to employ the same or a similar technique. We've made kind of a running gag of the three children. The girl taking advantage of the boy's intenseness in the game to steal his popcorn. Always keep your eyes open between main events. Look for cutaway possibilities. The cutaway scene may also be employed to convey an extensive lapse of time. Suppose the ball game you were photographing had three very dull innings, the third, fourth, and fifth, and you didn't take a foot of subject action. By substituting actual action with a quick succession of scoreboard shots, numerically showing the progress of the game through these periods, your audience could be made to feel that it had sat through the entire action. When the next bit of subject action appears on the screen, even though half an hour or more of play had taken place, the audience would be fully oriented, know how many innings had passed and the result of each. So you see, no matter how scattered your actual play-by-play -play scenes are, whether you want to cover up for skipping half a minute or half an hour of missing action, the correct cutaway can make the audience feel that nothing has been missed. The board shot is the natural end for this picture. Anything that could have been happening or existing during the game and that has some bearing on the main action of your picture is cutaway material. These extra scenes are to show you how cutaways can be faked. Admit it now. You thought that these youngsters were part of the actual crowd when you saw them before, didn't you? They were never at the game at all. In every cameraman's career, there comes a time when he finds himself possessing some interesting footage which, for one reason or another, is too incomplete to make a sustaining film. Professionals bridge situations like these by shooting extra scenes which build up to and lead away from the problem scenes. The result is a complete subject. Methods of buildup are limited only by your imagination. This man is accomplishing buildup by simply taking shots of his boy writing a letter and keeping the text of the letter confined to descriptions and discussions of people, things and places contained in the odd and end movies he had of his son. A complete little film story about a boy writing a letter to his pal is the result.
This cameraman isn't taking a picture. He's feeling for one in his finder. Indeed, feeling is the automatic tuning medium for all pictorial composition. When you sight through a finder, you're doing a lot more than making sure that your subject is merely going to be in the picture. You're actually composing a picture and putting a frame around it. You're doing the work of an artist. At last, our cameraman seems to be coming to something. We wonder if he knows why it's promising composition. Well, mainly it's because he's bringing that tree in at one side and because of that road running diagonally into the scene. Keeping foliage in the foreground is a great aid to composition. Designers of stage sets have used this technique for ages, utilizing wings on each side of the stage to give the illusion of depth. But depth giving foreground treatments need not always be trees. Notice how this arch makes the trolley seem to come from way back in the picture. So that you're sure to feel and see what we mean, we are showing you these scenes. First, without foreground treatment, then the almost identical scene with foreground. Quickly, what's the depth giving object in this scene? If you thought the lion, you thought right. A lot of confusion here, but if you spotted the pedestrian sign, you're right again. And here, of course, it's the jutting theater marquee at the left. So you see anything from trees to lifeboats can be used in the foreground as long as it's in the keeping with the mood of the scene. The barber pole in this scene, you're right. But in addition, notice how the diagonal line of the elevated structure lends depth. And observe how the diagonal approach to this engine seems to make it come right out of the screen. The diagonal line and the foreground treatment are each capable of doing a good job alone. But when combined as here, the foliage foreground plus the diagonal line of the fence, they are especially effective. As we said, composition is pretty much a sense of feeling. You wouldn't put a tree or a lamppost in the dominant center of a picture, but memorial or religious statuary you might. A kind of instinct tells you it's the thing to do. Feel for a picture in everything you see and strive to make your pictures portray what you feel. Whether you're going to take color or black and white movies, your first step in setting up lights will be the same. Arrange two or more reflectors so that the area you are photographing will be lighted head-on from the direction of the camera and so that there will be an even quantity of light spread over the whole scene. This is called flat lighting. In black and white movie making, a lot more is dependent upon and may be done with lighting, so we'll proceed with lighting for black and white. The second step for lighting the average black and white scene is to throw a more intense light in diagonally from one side of the set. Being more intense, this light casts shadows and creates highlights upon your subjects. Highlights and shadows in black and white photography are what give the all-important illusion of depth and roundness. To further this same illusion and give pictures the true professional sparkle, we employ either background lighting or back lighting. Background lighting is the throwing of controlled light upon a chosen area of background, no part of the ray directly touching the subject. Registering an entirely separate plane of light behind the subject in this way tends to make the subject stand out. In scenes where the accent is on romance, you'll find backlighting, the second professional treatment which we mentioned, especially pleasing. But to demonstrate this, we should have a little cooperation from the young lady. Remember me, I'm your husband. Backlighting is accomplished by throwing a concentrated light on the subject from behind. Since the light is now facing the camera, care must be taken to keep it tilted or shielded so direct rays do not shine into the lens. Backlighting will do more to Hollywoodize your pictures than most any other treatment. There is no absolute or set lighting formula. About the only rules that hold true generally are for mystery, suspense, horror,
play your main light from a single source, from almost directly above or from the floor immediately in front of the subject, casting hideous shadows. For comedy and routine scenes, flat lighting will usually serve best. While for romance, ah, let's take another look. 